Hi there, my name is Philip Heidson. I want to welcome you to the Art of Procurement podcast, the podcast that helps you, a forward-thinking procurement professional, position yourself and your team to proactively take advantage of the revolution that's taking place in procurement today. By interviewing industry trailblazers and sharing insights from our own experiences, my team and I pull back the curtain and shine a light on the strategies, tactics, and tools that procurement teams are using to elevate their impact. And today on the podcast, it's a pleasure to be joined by my good friend, David Latton. David is the head of global indirect procurement at Logitech. So one of the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals is to achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. It's the UN around this has a number of specific targets that make up the goal. And you can find those on the UN's website. They have tons of information around all the different 17 goals. But what has that got to do with procurement? And what can procurement do about it? And that is the topic of today's conversation with David. So David explains there's a lot that procurement can do to support gender equality. And in fact, we're particularly well positioned to do so. However, to kick things off, I wanted to start by asking my go-to introductory question to David, which was, did you find procurement or did procurement find you? Yeah, thanks, Phil. I think I think initially procurement found me. Mm. Um what brought me to procurement was I was coming from a from a reporting kind of control role beforehand, where it was a lot about reporting what Logitech had done uh, yeah. versus influencing what they will do, and and I think that really excited me about procurement in the first instance, and and also uh, again coming from that background, being involved in the commercials of roles and, and negotiating them was really exciting at first, and and that certainly brought me uh, to procurement, and then as as the years went on, I think what's kept me here. Is, is some of the sort of unique things that I didn't realize at first around procurement. And, and it's really thing, it's things like the unique position that, that procurement has in an organization that a well-functioning procurement organization should be really well connected with all quite disparate functions and, and what are their challenges and strategies and dreams for the years ahead. Mm-hmm. We should be really well connected to that. There are very few groups that are so well connected across the business. And then moreover, we should also be really well connected with potential external solutions uh, to some of those. So, so I think that's an exciting uh, position in the business that, that's kept me excited in procurement. And then more recently, again, and I think even more powerfully, is the power that you have in the role of a procurement to make sure that, that the business you work for is living the values of, yeah. of the business. And when I say that, I mean about we have a huge leverage to deliver on, on social values, environmental values just the sort of companies we want to work with and we're spending a lot of money with them. We have a huge impact in that space, which again, I didn't realize when I first joined, but that, that's certainly what's kept me in procurement. Yeah. And we're going to talk a little bit about that um, in a moment because, um, you know, that's becoming a, a bigger and bigger issue, an opportunity for procurement. Um, you know, I've just spent the last seven or eight weeks at a, a bunch of conferences and, you know, everybody is talking about how can procurement impact, uh, you know, around ESG, environmental, social governance, you know, whether it's diversity, whether it's social good, whether it's sustainability. And we're kind of figuring out now that, um, you know, what are the things that we can do? So we're going to talk about that in a little while. But before we go there, I did just want to kind of for context for folks who are listening, if you could explain a little bit more about kind of the size and scope of the procurement team at Logitech, kind of how are you and where are you in supporting the Logitech business from a procurement perspective? Sure. So so we're quite a lean team. Uh, my team primarily look after our indirect spend, mm-hmm. um, and we're quite a lean team to do that. We're a very global group. We're 14 people across the globe, um, very much a sort of typical category manager uh, structure with some buying roles as well. Um, and I think what we've discovered, and it's what every procurement function needs to discover, and it'll be a different answer depending on what business you're in, but but we've really discovered about what works at Logitech, and, yeah. and it's very much a partnership approach. Um, we're there to empower the business. Um, it's it's less about the rules say you must do X, Y, Z. It's more about what value can David's group bring to, to procurement, to, to, the, to the business rather. And, and, you know, that starts with building relationships. It starts with understanding their requirements. And, and it certainly starts with delivering value as well. I think with that model, if your partners aren't seeing the value in working with you, and that goes beyond just processes, it has to be what's mm-hmm. the value you're giving in terms of advisory, savings, um, assisting with strategy, et cetera. 
you really have to knock that out of the park in, in that model. And I think that's that's been a really important thing at Logitech about really partnering with the business. And and I think my category managers and buyers in the different functions, they're they're nearly they've nearly gone native into the business business groups and functions they partner with more than they have procurement. And, and I think that's that's what you need to do in that model too. Yeah. Uh, no, I couldn't agree more. It's about really embedding yourself um, and being kind of a key member of their team as opposed to somebody stood on the outside waiting to help when the business needs it. Exactly. Exactly. Because they may not come in that model. Right. Um, you know, Logitech has grown significantly over the last couple of years through the pandemic. How has that, has that kind of changed what your priorities are or how you're supporting the business? Because now the business is like, all right, we need to scale as opposed to maybe cost optimization was more important pre-pandemic. Yeah, I think it certainly has changed. And, and it's even changed today versus, dur- versus during the sort of height of the pandemic too, that that we grew dramatically during COVID. Pre-COVID, we were just shy of a $3 billion business. Post-COVID, we're, ne- we're now a fi- uh, sort of high 5 point something billion dollar mm-hmm. business. Huge growth. And rapid growth at that, and but it, it's also it's also changed the business dramatically too, and and what and what they look for from our procurement team. Um, there's a lot of changes in in terms of what you do as a five point billion dollar company versus a two point billion dollar company yeah. is going to be quite different. How we market is quite different. Um, but I think without, without repeating myself, I think the key points are still the same. That that my team and I need to be really plugged in with what's important to those different business groups and functions. Um, during the COVID boom, there, there was a huge growth in, 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 for us to support. Um, now we're more in a moderate growth environment. Mm-hmm. It's, it's gone a bit more back towards the sort of cost optimization front as well. But, but it's, we've also changed as a business, uh, just the, the size we are. We always, we always have this idea of wanting to be a small business. And I think we achieve that quite well but again what that means when you're when you're a two point something billion dollar company is different to when you're a five point right. something billion dollar company and and so it's a lot more complicated now potentially with with things like some of our privacy uh privacy governance and data security and things and that's all that's all absolutely necessary but but it, it's um it's different to what it would have been a few years ago so so i think if anything that just heightens the value case for procurement that that it's not on the different functions to necessarily know I'm working with supplier doing this. Do I need to go through some of these loopholes? I don't need to do this. I don't need to do that. And and it would easily to be lost, I think, in some of that. So mm-hmm. it's it's um it's just heightened that importance of of business partnering with with our partners. Well, uh, it has been really interesting for me to watch, kind of on the side, the growth that you've had at Logitech over the last couple of years. So um, um, you know, and the growth of of procurement and the the impact that you're having um, on the team there. Um, Now, I wanted to bring you onto the pod to talk about something you mentioned about social good and the importance of kind of the, I know how important culture is at Logitech. And um, you had just uh, launched a a coalition for gender fairness. I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a moment. But I want to ask why this topic of gender fairness is is something that's important to Logitech. Yeah, no, absolutely, Phil. You you mentioned culture there. And I think there's a few different answers to that question. And the first one is definitely Logitech as a company and, and our culture. Um, hugely values-driven business. Uh, one, of our, one of our core values is what we summarize as being equality and environment. And, and what we mean by that is, is that we are uh, nearly a $6 billion company with thousands of employees in our company. We are going to have an impact on this world. It, it's impossible to avoid that. We will have an impact on this world. What we want to do and what we aspire to do is make sure that impact is a positive one uh, mm-hmm. towards towards the environmental challenges to, to, towards the uh, what feels like the never-ending journey towards equality we want to make sure we're a positive impact towards that and and the coalition is really a, an actualization of that uh, I think slightly more broadly than that when you think about logitech and and where where we operate we're a consumer electro- electronics company um, that is an industry where where gender is certainly a very hot topic um, whether it be in, in talent and the jobs of tomorrow, the disruptive jobs of tomorrow, um, if you look at those, a lot of the, there's there's big gender issues even in those jobs of tomorrow with, mm-hmm. that we can disrupt the we can disrupt today's uh, economy with. Um, we have a lot of people in that space. It's um, consumer electronics has has had a long history really where I think gender equality is a really big topic for us. Even verticals such as gaming, um, again, it's a, it's a really hot topic about how can we make sure that it's a very gender equal. Uh, industry going forward so as a company 
not only our values, but, but where we operate and, what, and who we are as a company really mean that gender is front and center for us due to our culture. Yeah. And I think we can actually really make a big difference due to, due to where we are with consumer electronics and gaming. So, so that, that's really strong for us. And, and then more broadly, I think when you look at the wider society, we've got the ambitious SDG5 goal for a gender equality in 2030. It's looking really tough to, to hit that target. And we're only seven and a half years away from that. Um, indeed, a, a recent report from the World Economic Forum suggests that we're 136 years away from gender equality. Wow. Um, so there's a hell of a lot that needs to yeah. be done, uh, in short, and, and large organizations such as Logitech and others. We really need to realize that we can have a huge impact towards that and, and get going with that impact, because otherwise we're certainly never going to hit that SDG target in 2030, but, but, uh, unless we take some really dramatic action. So, so I think that's what we need to all be doing. So when you come at this with a procurement hat on, um, you know, what can we do? How can, uh, because I think that a lot of us in procurement will say that uh, absolutely those are goals that organizationally we should be focusing on achieving and, um, you know, enabling, but, you know, I sit in procurement. Can I really impact that much? Uh, you know, how, how do you look at that? Yeah, no, great question. And that's actually one of the bedrocks of, of what we were thinking around before we, before we sort of, uh, created the coalition idea and and i think it starts with this a lot of us do supplier diversity which is fantastic of course i i help stand up our supplier diversity program at logitech and, I, and i'm really passionate about that um but that's only part of the solution i think mm -hmm. when you look at it across organizations if you're lucky if you look at their whole spend it might be high single digits or even into low double figures if you if you're lucky about the spend with diverse suppliers and absolutely really passionate to keep on growing that spend um, but in our wildest dreams, that will only ever be part of the solution. And, and when you, like I talked about values earlier on, when, when we think about our value of equality, in an ideal world, all of our suppliers should share that value as our partner, and they should be doing something towards, towards improving progress towards that value of equality. So, so it goes beyond just what we do with diverse suppliers. It certainly needs to look at that 90-something percent of our spend that is with non-diverse suppliers today. Yeah. A lot of them are large organizations. What can we do with them? These large organizations can have a huge influence on gender equality. I mean, you, you could say we won't get to gender equality without these large organizations uh, making a really positive shift towards it. And, and I know there, again, we, we do tier two reporting quite a lot of us with that, and, and that's fantastic. Um, I think we can probably do a better job with that in, in terms of making sure it does deliver the influence that it's intended to, rather than I think in some cases it can become a bit of a tick box exercise. But tier two is really powerful, but I think we need to go beyond that and, and look at our large uh, partners, these large organizations that have really high impact in terms of workforce and, and revenues, and how can they be an ally for equality? I, I think we need to go beyond just the tier two reporting in terms of our large organizational uh, partners. Yeah, so it's about um, engaging and enabling those larger organizations, which have a bigger impact, as you say, for, for the best world in the world, diverse spend you know, the, the aggressive targets for organizations who are being like really putting a lot of investment in diverse spend are still going to be 15, 20% of their spend in total, you know, exactly. and, and most are probably in around the three to 5% at the moment. Exactly. Um, so as you say, that leaves the, uh, the 18, 90% of spend that, um, we can never really realistically hope to address, um, and so, so it's what do you do with that? So as you started on that process, I know you came across this organization called Gender Fair, uh, as you started to think about what you could do about this, you know, across that 80, 90% of the suppliers who are non-diverse. Can you talk a little bit about who Gender Fair is? Sure. Yeah. Gender Fair are a great organization um, that they operate in looking to influence uh, initially B2C spend. They were looking to influence where consumers make their spending decisions. And, and they did this by creating an, asse an assessment based on the UN Women Empowerment Principles to assess really well-known household names in the B2C space about how are they living up to the UN Women Empowerment Principles on a whole different number of angles ar around representation at leadership, policies, procedures, uh, advertising, does advertising break some of these uh, mm -hmm. uh, long-standing biases, et cetera, a whole, whole host of different areas. And, and they, on their website, if you look at it, they simply assess them as whether they're gender fair or not. It's, it's a simple yes or no. And, and ultimately, what they're trying to do is firstly influence 
I, I know, Phil, you, you do some running. They're, they're thinking yeah. Phil needs to buy some running shoes, go on to Gender Fair. Do you buy a pair of Nike or do you buy a pair of uh, Adidas or some, or some mm-hmm. other provider? Go onto the website and you can make a decision for yourself based on based on the gender fair assessment. I see. Yeah, they're, they're looking to do that, and then of course, in turn, if the buying power of consumers doing that can then hopefully start impacting companies that they all become gender fair. Yeah. So, so that's where they started. They've been there for I think they started in 2016, and and I looked at this and I thought, do you know what? Wouldn't that be a great way if we could start to influence B two B spend in the same way? Uh, so, so I started speaking with them. Um, Amy Cross is the founder at uh, Gender Fair. Her and I had some great conversations, and, and they were really excited by this by this idea of we can absolutely look to do a similar model of employing uh, of influencing rather B two B spend in the same way that they've influenced B two C spend, and and that's what that's what we've started working with them to do really. So essentially, being uh, not being gender fair, um, it becomes a competitive disadvantage. Exactly. Uh, if, if there was any. If there was any convincing that was needed on an organization that this wasn't the right thing to do, then you know you're going to be a competitive disadvantage as well if you don't get that certification. Yeah, exactly. I think that's that's one of the the sort of unwritten and almost unsaid kind of ideas here that that if enough of us start asking these questions and enough companies start becoming gender fair, then if you're not gender fair, which, which to be clear, that means you're not living up to the UN women empowerment principles, mm-hmm. which, which if you look at the number of organizations that have signed up f- for those principles, a lot of organizations have. Um, and yet I'll give you another statistic that so far out of the hundreds of organizations that gender fair have assessed, it's only around 10 or 15% of them that, that are doing enough today to pass that assessment. Um, so, so they're essentially not living up to the women empowerment right. principles. Um, one of the sort of unwritten ideas here is that make it a very standard thing that we ask these questions, make it an industry standard that, that as procurement people, we do privacy, we do data security, we do all that sort of stuff when we're looking at working with other large organizations. We should equally be asking around equality, gender equality in this case, but I think in the long run, we can do it with, with other, other elements of equality too. Make it that standard. And then, like you say, if you are one of those, uh, if you are one of those majority of the companies today, sadly, that, that, that have been assessed that aren't living up to the standard, it will definitely become that competitive disadvantage mm-hmm. um, if, if you're. And then, and then, of course, it will. Uh, it should. It should. It should ensure there's progress because of it. Do you know what kind of elements that they're being assessed on? Like, what are some of the kind of specific things that Gender Fair would look at to um, to determine if somebody is living up to those uh, standards. It's it's a few different things. I think why why we really like the assessment is when we were looking at doing this, we're looking at doing it with our high impact suppliers, which I think I said earlier, that's kind of, if you've got high revenue, yeah. you can make a big impact with your spend. If you've got high headcount, you can make a really positive influence with your own people and, and your policies around that. Um, so we're going to do that with a lot of our suppliers. We're going to assess a lot of our suppliers. And the idea is that we ultimately want other companies to start assessing their suppliers too. So, so we were, I think it was really important that the assessment itself is, whilst it's really powerful and reputable because it's linked to the UN Women Empowerment Principles, it needs to be scalable and not too heavy a lift to do it. Because I think if you're asking numbers and numbers of suppliers to do it, you need, you need there to be as few excuses as possible not to do it. And you need it to be as quick and easy to do as possible. And I think the gender fair assessment wins on all of those topics it's it's linked to the un WEPs, like i say so it's very reputable international standard it's a global standard so it applies to all companies it's it's only 15 questions um but they're very powerful questions i could answer a lot of them on on logitech's behalf myself and and it's really answering things like leadership representation either at the very top at ceo level board level uh executive leadership team what's the what's the representation of women in those levels um, employee policies are your policies uh, equality focused, women focused, family friendly focused, um, and then more into procurement world. There's certainly some elements around supplier diversity reporting, uh, social responsibility, and, and then I think the last one, which, which is an interesting one too, is about the, um, the the large organizations that are household names. Their advertising, of course, has a huge impact on on yeah. on addressing biases and, and long standing beliefs, etc. There's an element there around are you are you breaking are you breaking sort of gender stereotypes or are you breaking biases around there? So, so I think to sum all that up, really powerful assessment, touches on lots of different areas, um, but crucial to the success of the idea that we want it to become a standard that a lot of suppliers are assessed on this 
for that to have a chance of happening, it has to be something that isn't a massive lift. Um, and this isn't. So, so I think that that's that's kind of in a summary why we were really attracted to the to the gender fair assessment. Yeah, and I could, I could imagine that it's um, it will get more. I don't want to say more detailed because that might scare folks away, but it becomes you know the moment it's around getting a baseline, and then when it's it's proven to be um, you know something that is the uh, you know the standard mark, if you will, then there's perhaps an opportunity to then go a little bit deeper or do some uh, yeah. You know, ask additional questions, or uh, because it's going to be the 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 folks who are responding will recognise the value of the investment in time to do so. Yeah, um, no, absolutely. I think that's true, Phil. And, and another key point on that kind of topic is this idea that I take the assessment today for my company, and let's just say we're one of the minority that we pass as being gender fair. That's fantastic, but it's also not the end of the journey. And mm-hmm. And I think the most important thing we're looking for is progress, really. I, I think if everyone progresses, that's what society needs. And and that's equally true if your company doesn't score very well, but you take it upon yourself to improve some things. It could be something as simple as starting an ERG or building a supplier develop, diversity program or whatever it might be. That's progress. That's equally true whether you score an A star in the assessment or whether you score quite low. Yeah, I, I think that progress is the key point. And and also kind of linking into that idea, if you pass it today, again, great. But keep on, let's looking. Let's keep on looking to progress. And I think what's gender fair today? When we're, we're not at a gender equal world right now. So what's gender fair today? I would hope that the assessment is asking tougher things of you in two years, three years, five right. years time. Because you keep you need to keep on progressing. Yeah, that's the point. Because you know we're not at a gender equal state right now. So we talked at the very beginning about this idea of a coalition for gender fairness um, without really going into many details of what that is. So I wonder if you could um, talk around, you know, how you're looking to really corral the the procurement community into going on this journey to, um, you know, support gender equality together. Yeah, yeah. So I think I think what it is in a nutshell, it's a, it's a coalition of, uh, like-minded organisations looking to develop gender fairness, like I said, according to the UN Women Empowerment Principles. And I think what we mean by that, really, in, in terms of how we do this, it's we've started assessing our high-impact suppliers for gender fairness, and, we're, and we're, we're advocating and trying to influence them for progress in, in the years ahead. Um, but that's just Logitech. What we really want to do is is get a critical mass of companies that are doing the same thing. Yeah. So if we can bring others in the coalition with us, you've then got that combined spending power to influence our suppliers to take positive action on gender equality um, in, in the search for a, for a gender gender equal future. And, and I think it's a bit of a network effect, you could say, Phil, or it's an element of I'm I'm at this company. We have a really strong relationship with this handful of really high impact companies. I'm sure we can get them to move the dial. But you know what? We don't have that strong a relationship with some others that that could move the dial. Mm-hmm. Ah, yes, but the other two, three, four, five, however, however many other members of the coalition there are, will potentially have that strong impact with these other large organisations. And so it's that network impact of of looking to positively impact those suppliers and and making those companies look to progress on gen, gender equality. And so that's that's essentially what we're trying to do, uh, with, with the ultimate goal being a little bit like I've just said that that it's um. It's a change in procurement practices where we all, where, where all organisations assess all their high impact suppliers for gender fairness. Um, that it becomes an industry standard in the same way that we do privacy and data and, and other things. Um, with the ultimate goal there that, like I said at the top of the call, we're a long way from a gender equal world right now. The ultimate goal of doing all of that is, is to deliver dramatic and speedy progress towards a gender equal future. Um, that that's kind of the ultimate aspiration of the uh, of the coalition. Yeah, and collectively, the more folks that are asking for it, you know, the more RFPs that come along that have these questions in, the more that the suppliers will be taking this seriously. They'll realize it's not something, well, well, this is just something that, uh, you know, a couple of organizations are asking for. It's like, okay, exactly. this is important to, uh, you know, we need to, uh, um, you know, get our house in order and focus on this as a priority because it's now being the table stakes for everybody. Yeah. Yeah, no, do you know exactly, Phil. I was thinking about that only yesterday. That that um, in the in the research that I've done around around looking to stand up this coalition and talking to lots of great organisations, you do hear about some really good work that some of those organisations are doing. 
Um, it's very much driven by their own kind of teams and they develop their own questions and, and their own standards they look for suppliers to, to, to achieve. And that's all fantastic. That's great. Um, but they're, they're essentially kind of pockets of progress, I guess. And, and outside of those pockets of progress, they're, they're, there isn't an industry standard. Um, it's not scalable for everyone to do that, to be coming up with their own assessments, their own questions that they then go out to all of their suppliers. It's not scalable and easy for a lot of organizations to do that. Whereas, whereas exactly like you say, if we get to a point that there's an industry standard assessment and, and then latterly an industry standard way of reporting how, how, your, how your company is doing towards that standard, that all of a sudden becomes scalable. It becomes industry standard. Yeah. Everyone knows about it and, and the, the, um, the availability of doing it and the, and the pressure to do it for some of the laggards is, is a lot stronger than, than these, albeit great pockets of progress, but the pockets of progress that we have don't achieve that same sort of industry-wide scalability. And so if, if there's folks that are listening and thinking this is something that um, they feel like they would really like to get involved in, uh, you know, become a member of the uh, Coalition for Gender Fairness, are there some minimum requirements or are there certain things that you ask for coalition members to commit to? Like what, what's the commitment that they're making to being a part of the coalition? Yeah, I think when we were putting this together, we, we thought about a few things. And, and first and foremost... Uh, to be a member of the coalition, you need to be from an organization that's gender fair themselves. Yeah. Um, that actually dramatically self-limits the amount of companies that can join the coalition. Like I said, it's only around 10 or 15% of organizations that do pass as, as gender fair. But I think it's important from an authenticity point of view that, that you are a company that's gender fair and, you, and you're looking to, looking to progress it further to, to be a member of the coalition. And then if you are, to find out if you are, you need to do the assessment. You can do the assessment on Gender Fair's website. Um, it's very quick to order, um, very quick to answer. Like I said, it's 15 questions. I could mm -hmm. answer a lot of them myself with our sustainability report. Um, do that. Get yourself assessed. If you are, if you do pass the assessment in your Gender Fair, um, absolutely love to hear from you. Uh, there's a there's a landing page for the for the coalition which we can share. Uh, share as a link. It'd be fantastic to hear yeah. from you. And then, if if you if you join the coalition, the commitments are pretty simple, really. I think we're looking for that assessing yourself, like I say, to be gender fair. If you do that, we're really then looking for you to look at your suppliers and think, okay, who are our high impact suppliers? Who has that high headcount of their own? Who has those high revenues? Who can really change the world here? Because because uh, the World Benchmarking Alliance have done a lot of work around large organisations are essential to change the world. Work out who your large suppliers that you can do this assessment with are and do that. It, it might be 10 suppliers. It could be 25. It could be 50. Who knows? But do that with those suppliers. Um, that's the starting point. And then most important of all is, is the idea of progress. And have that conversation with them about, okay, you've scored X this year. Let's mm -hmm. look and try and score X plus 10 next year. Maybe if you can do A, B, and C, you can get there. Let's do that. And we'll, and we'll do our own assessment in a year's time. And we'll ask you to do your assessment in a year's time. That's the work, really. Um, and then also, of course, advocate for others to join, because yeah. I think that's the, uh, that's the network power that our ultimate aim is that it isn't just five progressive organizations. It becomes very standard that a lot of organizations have started to do this. And with the ultimate aim being, as with a lot of these sort of, uh, sort of endeavors, the ultimate aim would be that we don't need to exist anymore because right. we're getting a lot closer to a gender equal future. Yeah. Um, but of course, we're a long way away from that right now. And from a... An execution perspective, like when you're talking to your suppliers, are, are you going and saying, okay, going to my high impact suppliers and it's part of supplier relationship management and ongoing governance where you bring this up, you know, and, and interjecting this into a conversation um, as a as something that you would like them to um, you know, focus on, take the assessment on um, and start kind of a journey from, or are you just involve in putting it in your new RFPs. Like this is what we're going to do in, and we're going to assess you on a new RFP. Like how are you bringing this into kind of reality, if you will? Yeah, no, I mean, we're, we're doing both of those really, I think. Um, certainly with those new relationships, um, if it's a competitive process, we're absolutely looking to include it into our RFPs um, to, to, to compare the, the gender fairness of the yeah. different companies in the RFP. But also, again, that has a huge impact in terms of just getting it to be a a more well-known industry standard that, that we're asking that question um, because you're, you're involving a lot of suppliers in that RFP. We're absolutely doing that. Um, 
with, with new when we first start a relationship with a supplier that may not have gone through an RFP process, we're absolutely doing the same thing again there. That's a moment of leverage, isn't it? And and, and we're certainly asking them yeah. asking them at that point as part of working with us that this is an important value of ours. We want you to do the gender fair assessment. And then to that other point you said, Phil, we're absolutely doing that too. That, that um, I think it's uh, absolutely a part of that relationship management process and that performance management. Mm-hmm. Um, and and it's it's important. It's in that process, and it's imp- I think it's important that it's seen to be the t- the normal team that does that to be talking on this topic because that that highlights the point that this isn't something on the periphery of that. We do see this as central to this is relationship management. That's all to do with delivery on time, performance, um, value, and all the normal sort of things that procurement talk about. But we consider this central to it too. I think if you do that through the same team, you, you kind of highlight that point that this yeah. isn't we're, we're not bringing in a different function um, to look at this because it's something different. We, we consider this central to that relationship fit with us. It, it is that value fit. So, so in short, we're doing all of those things that mm-hmm. you said, Phil. Now, um, as you look to harness this coalition and bring this coalition of members together are you looking at then kind of creating almost like a community of coalition members uh, and what i mean by that is kind of collectively figuring out okay how can we push this forward further and how can we help embed these practices within our own businesses within our supplier ecosystem um so you're looking to b- essentially yeah build a community around those who are part of a coalition so it's more than just hey saying i'm a co- coalition member it's actually being part of the uh, solving the problem in the future. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. I mean, this is a this is of course this this is the start of the coalition, but it's yeah. the start of the, the start of the journey towards gender equality. And I think um, in the initial instance, uh, there's a real power in building that scale and and getting it to be a to be a, become a well known industry industry standard that we ask these questions. I think that's a really powerful piece of the puzzle. Um, Raising it as a topic, getting progress towards gender equality as we see it today is a really important topic. Um, we don't have the answers to all of these by any mm-hmm. means, and I think that's certainly what we look at the coalition as is is a is a think tank to sort of brainstorm on the best way to achieve this. Even that point around SRM, like you said, um, the vast majority of organisations are, are quite tight on their resource. They're they're very busy. How can we how can we do this in a way that can be scaled and can easily be plugged into to organizations' ways of working? I think that's really important and, and we need to work that out um, to get progress towards towards the, the sort of gender fairness um, assessment that it is today. I, I think that's at scale, that's really the first objective. But absolutely, like I said, um, we're a long way away from gender equality today. What's gender fair in 2025 should be different to what it is today. Mm-hmm. That again is another angle where where I think the coalition need, needs to be taking things about. Do you know what? This isn't in the assessment today. Whereas, and this is a big topic in the in these industries. Maybe we should look at putting it in the in the assessment. And that has to be done correctly because there is a there, there is an important piece that that it's a very scalable and easy to do assessment. And if you lose that, I think it, it might make it more yeah. difficult to scale. Yeah. But but there's the, the simple idea of what's gender fair today is not what should be gender fair in 2025, 2030, and and. Ultimately, being in the coalition, I think we don't know the answers to those questions. We're at the start of all that, but but as a society, we need to find those answers. And, and I think the coalition is a great way to to use our combined spending power, but also our combined thinking, really, to, to work out what is the best way to do this as an industry, as a, as a wider corporate sector, really. So if folks are listening are interested in learning a little bit more or just reaching out and connecting with you directly to learn more about... Um, the the coalition and around gender fairness where would be the best places to direct them to yeah we have we have a landing site for the coalition which mm-hmm. i think we can we, we can share the link on um on the page i guess phil yeah and uh, we can absolutely do that and then and then a more predictable answer if people want to reach out to me directly absolutely always happy to talk on this or, or other procurement topics and it's the usual you can find me on linkedin uh, answer on that one yeah, perfect now what i'll do is um you can share the link with me david and what we'll do is we'll put that in the show notes uh for today's Brilliant. episode and we'll put that along with a link to your linkedin profile as well and, and anybody that just goes to art of procurement.com slash podcast um you will find um this episode amongst all the other episodes that we have there um and then just go to those show notes so david i want to thank you so much for joining me for talking 
about, I mean, it's a really important topic and the, the fact that you're taking action um, one speaks to your personal values and two speaks to the values of Logitech um, for, you know, being really passionate about wanting to drive this, not only for Logitech, but for our industry. I think I'm seeing more and more examples of industries recognizing the need to work together as opposed to operating in a silo. Uh, and this is definitely one of those things. Brilliant. So thank you for having me, Phil. Pleasure to be here. If this episode struck a chord with you, please do send it to somebody. We grow here at Art of Procurement through word of mouth, and that would be really appreciated. You can also support us by giving us a thumbs up, a star rating, or a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. Since 2015, we've built the world's largest free resource for procurement professionals looking to elevate their impact. Our resources span podcasts like this, videos, blog posts, papers, and events. To join us on the inside and to ensure you never miss an episode, a webinar, an event, or a post, please do subscribe to our weekly newsletter, This Week in Procurement. You can do that at artofprocurement.com slash subscribe. That's artofprocurement.com slash subscribe. Thank you for joining us today, and I look forward to seeing you again soon.